So today I will talk about using human brain organoids as a window into the brain's primordial operating system. So I just started my lab almost about two years ago at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I did a long postdoc at UC Santa Barbara um, before then, so I'm excited to share uh, some of the progress we've made in our short time in my new lab. So first I'll start, what do we know about the brain's operating system? So similar to a computer, the brain runs on electrical signals. So here's a picture of uh, Intel's i9 CPU. Um, and here's a kind of a, di a diagram of a transistor, right? So these simple t um, sets of logical elements can do very complicated things. Um, but unlike a computer, the brain is a mushy, complex blob of living tissue. Um, and it self-assembles according to genetically programmed rules. So we, we, are the, we are beginning to uncover some of these rules, but most of them are unknown. So the process of human brain development starts sh shortly after conception and continues into early adulthood. So within a few weeks, the neural tube forms. There's a picture of it here. Um, after week three, the fetal brain begins to develop. So neural progenitors, uh, neural progenitor cells begin to divide and differentiate into neurons as well as glia. So these are the two cell types that form the basis of the central nervous system. At week nine, so within the first two months of development, long before it can receive external information, the cells that form the neocortex, so this is the brain region responsible for sight, sound, spatial reasoning, conscious thought, and language, they begin to communicate. So spontaneous activity here is a key feature of the developing central nervous system. Uh, it's conserved across species and brain regions. So here you can see is resting state fMRI uh, in a human brain. Uh, so there's some really interesting features to, um, that project back onto the spatial topology of the network. Uh, I won't touch on that right now, but you can look into this paper and read more about it. So these features are conserved from fish um, to rodents. Uh, so the mouse brain has 70 million neurons. Uh, in humans. So the human brain has roughly 100 billion neurons with over 100 trillion synaptic connections. So do these spontaneous emergent activity patterns, do they reflect a pre-configured basis needed for computing? Or are these patterns merely nonsensical murmurs of an organ awaiting sensory experience? So th these are some of the questions that we're really interested in answering. So the big problem here is a research bottleneck. Um, neuron signal, uh, signaling occurs at millisecond time scales. So you can see on the left here is, is a, a cartoon diagram of a neuron and its extracellular field. Now, if you were to patch clamp a neuron, you would see that when it fires an action potential, this occurs over a millisecond duration and the change in potential is close to 100 millivolts. Now, if you go outside of the cell, those fields attenuate very quickly, and the fields fall off roughly inversely with the distance from the soma. So functional circuitry likely operates at the mesoscale, which means that we need to measure hundreds of thousands of network neurons to understand how the neural code operates. So one of the fundamental limitations that was posed by Roman E. Cajal in 1923 was that our fundamental underlying limitation is our ignorance of the brain's microcircuitry. The synaptic connections contained within the brain in any given brain area, which uh, Cajal referred to as impenetrable jungles where many investigators have lost themselves. So here's one of his early sketches uh, in the early 1900s. Um, and I would say that Cajal's comments from 1923 still remain true today. So here is a reconstruction of a 500,000 cubic millimeter section uh, from the mouse brain. So at four weeks old, it yields 2.7 meters of neural cables. 3% are shown up front, um, implementing a connectome of over 400,000 synapses between 34,000 axons with 11,000 postsynaptic dendritic processes. So all of these maps, as amazing as they are, are reconstructions that come from postmortem tissue. These static maps tell us nothing about how living networks function and how they compute. <clears throat> Most of our current 
tools for live cell imaging give us coarse grain maps. So for instance, EEG, MEG, and fMRI give us voxel resolution, which is about a cubic millimeter. Um, these fields are back calculated from potentials that are generated within the brain, um, but they have allowed us to uncover some amazing features, such as uh, centers for hearing, touch, and vision. So as of today, there are roughly 180 known regions in the cortex. Um, this is all um, gathered by the Human Connectome Project. So like in many fields, it's great to borrow technology from others. Um, so technology borrowed from the semiconducting industry has enabled uh, major advances in systems neuroscience. So here is the Neural Pixels Probe. The first paper came out in 2017. This is a collaboration at Genelia and, uh, and um, uh, IMEC uh, in Belgium. Um, so here's a picture of the NeuroPixels probe. So here you have roughly a thousand sensors integrated on a silicon shank. Uh, their interelectrode pitch is roughly that of a soma, around 20 microns. And these measurements allow uh, the community now to capture uh, hundreds of neurons uh, across the mouse brain. Although um, one major limitation here is that it's, it's a very narrow cross-sectional uh, uh, footprint. But this technology now has been approved for use in humans to probe neural activity within the cortex. A large slew of papers are now coming out uh, showing it. Um, so here is a picture of the probe uh, accessing the roughly few millimeters uh, in the uh, cortex. Um, so this allows us to attain precision of neurons in a cortical column, but some of the major limitations are, again, we have to bypass the skull uh, the probes can only collect activity from a few hundred neurons, and again, it remains a very local map of uh, information that's clearly distributed across uh, a larger surface area. So currently, right now, we lack the technology to study how functional circuits are, est are established during brain development. You can see here is a, a diagram of, of a uh, human, uh, um, early developing human in inside of the uterus. Um, we have right now a problem accessing brain tissue through the skull, so can you imagine um, it's practically impossible to study functional circuits um, in the developing human. So our solution in the lab here, well, let's grow the cortex in a lab to directly access tissue in controlled laboratory conditions. So that's kind of outlines where uh, the motivation for my talk. Um, so I'm gonna talk about this interesting theory of neuronal Darwinism. Essentially, evolution has built the brain from the bottom up. Um, and then I'll move on to talk about modeling brain development with organoids. Um, and then I'll touch on this idea of organoids as a, as a window into the mind. So first, let's start with this theory of neuronal Darwinism. So this working hypothesis was developed by Gerald Edelman in 1987. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in the 70s uh, in physiology. Um, and has really posed a lot of wild theories about the developing human brain. So similar to evolutionary biology, neural function uh, is governed by natural selection and should favor pre-configured networks that are built from the bottom up. So current technology limits direct evaluation of this theory, making it challenging to separate complex networks from the effects of experience. But over the last decade or so, research has shown that functional properties of neurons are conserved in the cortex as well as other brain regions, such as log normally distributed spike transmission probabilities that have been painstakingly measured uh, using patch clamp in the cortex, as well as also skewed log normally distributed uh, uh, synaptic uh, uh, bouton sizes. Um, so these two, the size of the synaptic bouton, which is where, where the neurotransmitter is released across the, across the synaptic cleft, uh, is related to, to spike, spike transmission probabilities. So this is, a, again, just a few examples, but this body of data suggests that functional states may emerge from pre-existing circuits. And if this is the case, do they emerge before sensory input? Um, this is the big question, nature versus nurture, which is uh, really hot now in systems neuroscience. So I will now touch base on how we can model brain development with organoids. So as I stated earlier, moral, ethical, and technical uh, limitations limit our ability to map brain circuits during fetal life. 
Um, so understanding neural developmental process will answer some of the most fundamental questions of our time. How does the brain, the most complex piece of matter, uh, build itself? And how do mutations in neural developmental genes lead to wide-ranging phenotypic outcomes? So these questions remain unanswered because existing techniques using animal models fail to re recapitulate basic features of human conditions. And post-mortem analysis of the human brain tissue cannot reveal the brain's functional state. So we believe that brain organoids grown from human and disciplinary potent cells have the potential to answer some of these questions. So what are brain organoids? So brain organoids are a self-organized neuronal system grown from human induced pluripotent stem cells. So we get reprogrammed IPSCs from, from our collaborators at UCSF, WashU, Santa Barbara, as well as many other labs across uh, the nation. Um, and what we do is we aggregate those um, and we can expose them to molecular and protein cocktails to, in, to induce them into a neuronal uh, a fate and allow them to self-organize following their own pre-programmed rules. And here you can see as an organoid at one month, roughly a few millimeters in diameter. So organoids form a cellular scaffolding that can uh, support complex neuronal networks. So here you can see our network of glial cells or astrocytes, which are the support sca scaffolding necessary to sustain neuronal networks. Here you can see our, in green, our long axons coursing through uh, dendritic fields, which are shown in red, labeled by this uh, antibody MAP2. And again, we have a broad uh, diversity of cell types, both excitatory and inhibitory neurons. Uh, here are inhibitory neurons shown in green, labeled by GAD65. And again, we have a subset of, of interneurons, uh, which are parvalbumin positive, which are very important for uh, uh, controlling spike timing. And again, we have, uh, um, presynaptic proteins decorating dendrites here, shown in uh, gray. So again, what I want to state is in 3D, if we allow the system to self-organize, we can develop a diversity of cell types that recapitulates the basic building blocks of the central nervous system. Now, you can't do this in 2D cultures. So this is really a profound uh, self-organized system that we can use as a model to study uh, pre-programmed wiring rules. So now what we can do is use state-of-the-art CMOS detectors to peer into activity generated by human brain organoids. So what we're using are, are collaborating with the Swiss group at ETH, as well as the, spin -up, the startup company um, that uh, was founded by one of the graduate students in Andreas Herleman's lab. Um, and we have 26,000 recording sites that we can record from that have an interelectrode pitch of 17.5 microns. So for scale, here is a, is a hair here, so we can fit many, uh, many electrodes across the cross-sectional area of a hair, which is roughly 70 microns in diameter. So I'll talk a little bit about some published work. Um, so here we uh, were able to interface these organoids with these high-density chips here, and it allowed us to have high-bandwidth uh, profiling of neural activity generated by these brain organoids, as well as look at lo local field potential oscillations. And we also use neuropixel probes to access uh, tissue throughout the volume. So here is a map of a uh, cross-sectional profile of spiking activity sampled across 26,400 sites. And on the right here is a activation of, of detected spikes above uh, five times the background noise. So you can see here is a synchronized burst event followed by periods of quiescence and again, uh, continued reverberation. So this, this span is just one, one spontaneous burst that spans several hundred milliseconds. Now what we can do with these uh, high resolution arrays is actually map the functional footprint generated by single neurons and using this channel redundancy, isolate spike times with high fidelity that are generated by a single neuron. And from these spike timing maps, we can construct a graph of functional connections using spike timing. So here is a raster plot here, generated by spike sorted neurons. And here you can see these periods of bursting dynamics that occur, as well as a weaker background sea of, of more sparser activity. So to construct these graphs of functional connectivity, what we can do is look at all pairwise spike trains and then count essentially the uh, the, um, the overlap of spikes that occur between a pre and putative post synaptic unit. So what we do here is we can see that a subset of these neurons have these very sharp peaks that occur within roughly five milliseconds. 
and we can essentially identify those peaks, and then what we use to normalize this uh, and calculate a correlation strength is using the spike time tiling coefficient. I won't go into the details here, but essentially from this we can look at a transmission probability and a lag time. And from there, uh, we can assess uh, putative monosynaptic connections based on the spike timing, which occurs on roughly five milliseconds. So here we can infer functional coupling strength and, and its direction based on this latency. And here we can derive a graph of functional connectivity that spans all these pairwise interactions. So here each node represents a identified single neuron and uh, f this graph is constructed, uh, the weight of the graph, uh, or sorry, the, the, the line uh, thickness is uh, determined by the correlation strength. In its degree, how many other neurons it's talking to is this bubble size. So you can see some neurons are sending information, some neurons are receiving information, and some are this mixed state, both sending and receiving, we refer to them as brokers. So what is cool, if we look at the probability distribution of all these connections, we see that uh, this network uh, really can be viewed as a skeleton of strong connections within a weaker background C of weak ones. Um, and this is really, I think, profound because uh, if painstakingly you look at patch clamp data in the cortex, you'll see that functional connections also follow this similar scaling rule. Um, and it's believed that higher order brain circuits such as the cortex are characterized by this network property. And neuroscientists widely believe that this feature is important for the computational capacity uh, that resides in the cortex. So this is cool to really recapitulate a functional scaling rule in a system that's grown devoid of sensory input. Now we can do some fun experiments um, dosing these, uh, these uh, brain structures with neuropsychiatric drugs. So we were interested in studying the effects of inhibition. So diazepam is a neuropsychiatric drug, other, other name for it is Valium. Um, so at a low dose, it's anxiolytic, anti-anxiety, and a high dose, it's a sedative. So there's a state transition that occurs here, and we were interested in exploring that pace, or, sorry, that, that, uh, that space. So again, here in control in diazepam, uh, this is at uh, micromolar concentrations. Uh, we can see, again, a big shift in the network. And what we can see at a higher concentration is that uh, this effect of modulating inhibition really strengthens the correlations between this uh, minority fraction of strongly connected neurons. Um, and this was a consistent across uh, several organoids. So this results, what we thought were interesting, parallel, um, paralleled an fMRI study, which just looks at functional correlations between larger regions in the brain um, that showed that, that uh, um, diazepam increases uh, uh, functional connectivity in the medial visual cortex. So um, this gives us a unique access to study the effects of neuropsychiatric drugs uh, in human-derived tissue, um, and we were excited about that opportunity. So I'll give a brief summary of this work, and I'll talk about some newer work. So again, brain organoids contain a neural architecture um, that is capable of supporting complex networks. We can use state-of-the-art uh, technology to interface with these structures um, and we showed that the features are highly non-random um, in nature, um, and these findings suggest a greater degree of complexity than was previously suspected, and that organoids can serve as a tool for the evaluation of, of CNS drug effects in human-derived tissue. So now, in the remaining time, I'll talk a little bit about using brain organoids as a tool to uncover pre-configured brain states. So this previous work represents statistical relationships between, uh, that emerge over minute timescales, um, but the temporal dynamics of neural ensembles plays an important role in their function. So I'll start here with, um, so temporal information can be used to encode information. This is widely known. So cortical circuits generate coordinated large-scale activity patterns across different brain regions. So for instance, here's the auditory circuit. Uh, here are different neurons responding to a specific tone, showing sequential pattern with a progressive variance as, as the uh, neurons um, occur later in time with respect to the onset of the tone. This also occurs in uh, touch. So in the somatosensory cortex, you can see similar neurons. Uh, these distributed networks have same thing, delays uh, with different degrees of jitter with respect to the uh, interaction with the environment and also works in tastes or the olfactory circuits. Again, these latencies are consistent with the onset of, uh, of, the, of the sense. So the exact timing and number of spikes convey information about the identity of the stimulus, but what is really cool 
recent work has shown that these same activity patterns uh, are present in the brain's resting state. This is called the default mode. So such evidence uh, supports this hypothesis that functional states may emerge and draw from a pre draw from pre-existing circuits. There's a great review on this if you want to dig into it a little bit further. Yet it remains unknown when these states emerge and if these states emerge before sensory input. And I'll just add one, one other kind of background story here. So recent recordings now in humans have shown that the presence of these stable spiking sequences, these are conserved across cognitive states and are also present in the default mode. So we lack the tools to interrogate brain circuits during early brain development, but brain organoids will allow us access to the activity of complex circuits. And what is cool is that these circuits assemble in an experience-independent manner. So can the intrinsic wiring of neural circuits in brain organoids generate internal patterns? That was the, the question we asked here. And uh, yeah, the, the answer is they do. So if we look at spontaneous activity patterns and transform the spike times into an instantaneous firing rate, we can see these onsets of these sequences. So it's not random. There are temporal delays. Um, and there's a subset of those neurons that form these, these sequences, which we're calling backbone units. Um, and these are immersed within a larger background of more irregular firing patterns. And again, just signal averaging all, all instantiations of the spontaneous burst, we can see that there is this kind of arrow that emerges. Um, and again, a broadening and a narrowing here. And again, I'd just like to remind you, in vivia spontaneous and evoked responses follow similar sequences uh, in, the, uh, in the rodent brain. Um, and here you can see, again, this is the mouse auditory cortex. So there's an analog here. Uh, the time scales are a little bit different, but we, we see temporal structure that is emergent. So if we look at these firing patterns, we can see that some of these units occur early, some are later relative to one another, and others are just random. Again, here are the auditory tones in the cortex of the mouse. Um, so what we see that these backbone sequences populate a tail of a log normally distributed uh, distribution, and that cortical networks have, in the case of our brain organized a non-random structure, as well as in vivo, this non-random structure is where a small number of strong connections are embedded within this pool of weaker connections. These constraints may uh, result in different stimuli producing similar activity packets, but because activity is preferentially propagating through the strongest connections, this is why uh, these, uh, these uh, networks bias towards the stronger connections. Um, so I'll briefly survey through. So we did a broad study here with, in collaboration with, with uh, other labs at e ETH and WashU. Uh, looking at uh, emergent structure in the early developing somatosensory cortex of the mouse, um, as well as random data generated from 2D cultures which have been uh, dissociated and assembled. Um, again, these, these 2D cultures don't have any inter inherent temporal structure and everything is hyperconnected and uh, uh, essentially co-localized with the burst. So we did a lot of fun computational modeling. I won't go into that, but essentially what we found is that the 3D tissue that self-assembles has a higher dimensional space that is uh, a balance between regular and irregular Poisson-like firing patterns. Um, and that 2D cultures are dominated by this random spiking patterns, whereas 3D self-organized systems um, have a balance between random and structured activity patterns. Um, we did some great work studying, studying these state transitions using a hidden Markov model, but um, you can look at the preprint to read more about it. So in summary, in this work here, we demonstrate that basic computational building blocks of the brain are established as pre-configured networks. Uh, we reveal that non-random structures are capable of generating sequential patterns of activity, previously relegated to mature circuits as experience independent phenomena in both human brain organoids and the murine neocortical circuits with underdeveloped sensory systems. So these findings establish human brain organisms as a powerful tool to model, um, as a model to address the, the, the problem of nature versus nurture and developmental systems neuroscience. Um, and how are we on time? I have a few more. Okay, I think we got another 10 minutes. So I have a few more slides, but I, um, but I would like to thank our project collaborators. It's an amazing group at UC Santa Cruz, Santa Barbara, Hamburg, ETH, and Wash U, um, spanning um, experimental, computational, and theoretical work. Um, 
And this is our big crew uh, at the Brain Engineers Consortium, which is a collaboration between all of these labs. Um, there's a group at UCSF, engineer at Santa Cruz, a biologist at Santa, Santa Cruz, David Hauser here that does genomics as well as uh, machine learning, um, and, a, and a lots of undergrads, grad students, and postdocs. Oh yeah, here's Keith Hengen who does systems neuroscience at Wash U. Um, so I will, with a few minutes that are remaining, touch on some uh, really fun work that um, should be out soon um, as, as a teaser. Um, but yeah, but okay, so yeah, here's my lab. Uh, we're a small group in Santa Cruz. Um, please reach out if you wanna chat more about the work that we're doing. But this is some of the future work that we're doing right now. So um, this is how we're envisioning the future of these organoids. So enabling organoids to interact with the world. So um, being able to deliver sensory inputs as well as motor outputs. So we're creating open source tools and technology uh, for closed loop brain organoid interactions. Uh, so right now we've been playing around with some pilot studies actually solving this control theory problem which is the inverted pendulum. Um, and so imagine here raising these organoids with and without sensory inputs, then immersing them in a world of artificial stimuli. Would they adapt forging new paths in the synthetic landscape um, or flounder lost without the familiar cues of the natural world? Our findings suggest that these organoids might possess an intrinsic framework, uh, an intrinsic framework ready to engage with sensory input, a prelude to learning and adaptation. So our interdisciplinary group at UC Santa Cruz uh, is developing, called Brain Engineers, is building open source tools to enable first steps along this path. Um, so here are some, some um, embedding organoids in a virtual environment. So we're solving this classical control theory problem using closed loop feed feedback and bi-directional uh, signaling with uh, these high density microelectrode arrays. This is kind of the, the framework for how we do it. And here you can see is the brain organoid uh, creating an output that can control the balancing of this inver inverted pendulum in a virtual environment. So this speculative journey raises profound questions. Are we witnessing the nascent strings of neural operating system, a pre-configured syntax waiting for experience, or are these merely echoes of potential unfulfilled, unfulfilled without sensory input? So by exploring these questions, we aim to unlock new insights into the genetic and neural foundations of brain development pushing the boundaries of what we know about the brain's capacity to adapt and learn in both natural and synthetic environments. So this exploration is not just about the science, it's about um, reimagining the brain's potential, daring to ask how it might respond when the world it encounters is one we've yet to dream up. Yeah, yeah. That's, it. that's it, thank you.